it is difficult to identify as a feminist because it's so stigmatized in our communities. I have the responsibility of giving back to society. I've got a lot to lose. A lot of the animosity and really craziness that's out there, there's tremendous hatred of women. I can't believe a film about menstruation just won an Oscar. When the Nariyandolans <laughs> came to the Nari, who wanted to go to the Nari? Hi, welcome back. It's still Women's History Month and I'm still urging you to go watch documentaries featuring some incredible women. After the five we spoke about last week, which you can watch here, the link, part two of this video will heavily feature stories from India. Let's go. Five. Period, end of sentence. It's on Netflix if you have a subscription. And if you don't have a subscription, you can watch it for free on the Netflix YouTube channel. Much has been spoken, written and discussed about this Oscar-winning documentary co-produced by our very own Gunit Monga. Period, end of sentence is not just about women and menstruation and organizations which encourage awareness and conversations about that time of the month. This Short 25 minute docu serves more as a reminder of the fact that we still refer to a scientific bodily function as that time of the month and that this is not a problem limited to some parts of the country as a rural India may it's kind of still national. The film goes beyond innovator Anunachanam Muruganantham's achievements with director Raika Zetabchi focusing her lens on the women doing the legwork and actually getting the sanitary pad making machines to villages in particular Hapur in Uttar Pradesh. On the surface, period end of sentence is simple and straightforward and you might even begin to feel like it's not telling you something that you don't already know. But stay with the women you're watching on the screen and let them remind you, let them bring you an awareness that many many people who menstruate in India still live a life lacking in basic human needs and rights on a basic existence level. Such a reminder is never a bad inclusion in your day. You know, perhaps the most incredible thing to come out of this film was the PAD project, an organization which still continues to work in cities across the world. According to their website, the padproject.org, the team which you can join as an ambassador slash volunteer, by the way, partners with local organizations and grassroots NGOs to install PAD machines, implement reusable cloth PAD making programs and run menstrual hygiene management workshops. So, in case you haven't watched this film already, it's like 25 minutes long on YouTube. So, dekh lo na. Number 4. What She Said, The Art of Pauline Kale. You can watch it for free on Tubi. Hmm. Until recently, there were many moments stretching into days where the only productivity emerging from me would be an incredible amount of pity for myself. I would vocally lament how much I get vilified for voicing my opinions on films. How many men charge in unison in hordes in the comment section ready to hurt me and how a bunch of people don't take me seriously as a film critic just because my reviews feel more personal, they're very acerbic or perhaps even silly because of the way I present. Until I watched this movie at the Mami Film Festival a few years ago. Pauline Kael, born in 1919, was a film critic writing for the American magazine The New Yorker from 1968 to 91. Back at the time when cinema was an entirely male-dominated industry, the filmmakers were men and the people writing peons about the achievements of these men but also men. She came into the field and started reviewing cinema through her personal, audacious style of self-assertive opinion pieces, slowly but surely changing the game on how cinema is preserved for posterity via the written word and analysis. The film, made almost two decades after the subject's death, explores not just her work, her life, but also the purpose of film criticism and how that in itself is an art form, commanding respect and attention. When asked if she thought her work affected filmmaking at all, Pauline Kell said, If I say yes, I'm an egotist and if I say no, I've wasted my life. We also meet her daughter talking about her, kind of like Ruth Bader Ginsburg's children spoke about RBG in the Oscar-nominated documentary about how seriously she took her work and how very intimate, almost physical her whole approach towards cinema was. One look at the title of the books written by Pauline Kell will tell you as much. I lost it at the movies. Kiss, kiss, bang, bang, when the lights go down, so on and so forth. Sarah Jessica Parker reads some of Pauline Kael's work in a voiceover and the film makes 
regular pit stops checking in with filmmakers and actors like Quentin Tarantino, David O. Russell, Alec Baldwin. There's a ton of archival footage of Pauline herself and also others talking about her packaged very comprehensively. Don't shy away from what she said thinking this was only a movie about film criticism relevant for people interested in writing. No, this is also an insight into culture and what shapes it. How and where conversations are birthed and how many need to happen in quick succession for paradigms to shift. It's a study into the resilience of a woman in the face of not just men controlling her entire industry but also resilience in the face of dwindling finances being a single mother. Like Fran Lebowitz in Pretend It's a City, Pauline Kael makes me want to be more me. In this case, even more pointedly so. I found so much strength in this film and I hope you will too. Before we move on to the Ekdam Top 3 Docu's casual reminder to subscribe to the channel casually. Thanks. <laughs> All right, number three, Daughters of Destiny. It's a four-part docu-series. You can watch it on Netflix. Now, bringing you back to India to an incredible story, which I am amazed not a whole lot of people I've met in my bubbles have brought up. Because you don't know This 2017 series was painstakingly shot over seven years. Yes, S-E-V-E-N, seven. Y-E-A-R-S, years. We are taken to Shanti Bhavan, a boarding school in Tamil Nadu. Founded by Dr. Abraham George, an Indian who worked in America for many years, built a company, sold it, took the money, came back to India to start Shanti Bhavan, which is now run by him, his son Ajit George and their team. Shanti Bhavan takes in children aged four from the most marginalized, underprivileged families and uh, they basically pay for their entire lives, education, nutrition, stay, everything until the children get a job. Majority of these children are from Dalit families. This docuseries follows four students. They're all girls, Tenmidi, Preeta, Shilpa and Kartika. Oscar-winning documentary filmmaker Vanessa Roth returns multiple times over seven years to shadow and interview these girls as they discover who they are, their potential. Protected within Shanti Bhavan's campus, where the world is not out to get them. You know, if you're looking for inspiration and hope, you needn't always look towards successful women older than you. Daughters of Destiny is a reminder that a way to inspire yourself to move your butt and do something worthwhile with your own life can also just come from looking at girls and women around you. Simply try to live, make the best of their situations. I approached the series with a little trepidation, not wanting to make the same mistakes I did with Article 15 and not being able to recognize the upper caste savior syndrome at play. Someone with means swoops in and saves the day and gets praised, while no one acknowledges the need for people to be portrayed as heroes in their own stories. After watching these four hour-long episodes, I felt the gays attempted to highlight the sacrifice of their parents who agree to split up their families and give up their four-year-old daughters to be educated in the face of a lack of options without their involvement. Yes, the George family's tireless work is celebrated, but by making these four girls the central subject of the docuseries, it transcends from being a profile of Shanti Bhavan alone and attempts to have a larger conversation about India's caste system. The film also doesn't shy away from highlighting some fundamental issues with Shanti Bhavan's operations. That they overestimated what it would take to run a school like this in India. Also their rule of only admitting one student per family so as to spread their resources as widely as possible. It leads to extremely unhealthy sibling rivalries. It also goes over their need to constantly learn more about where these girls come from and what they are doing by allowing them to suddenly dream beyond their family's wildest imaginations and what that actually means outside in the real world, the responsibilities they carry as surrogate parents. You might feel that the series is dragging a little bit, the episodes are long, but if you can spend hours upon hours watching absolutely unnecessary circular documentary series about crime at the Cecil Hotel in Los Angeles, you can make time for this. And mujhpe maroza rakho. Please watch. Number two, feminists. What were they thinking? That's also on Netflix. If you wanted a crash course and second wave of feminism, in particularly focused on America, where it was most popular in the 60s and the 70s, this doc is perfect with a capital P. With a female director, producer, music composer, editor, cinematographer, this documentary is an abridged telling of the women's rights movement spanning two decades. 
were standing on the shoulders of the first wave feminists, the suffragettes. Now the second wave, which had more artists than ever before, took to the streets again, this time chanting, the personal is political. Sometimes as women, we tend to feel rather alone in our fight to make room in male-dominated spaces, a lonely suffocation. SMA, this documentary acts as a splendid reminder of the fact that feminism has literally come in waves. There are many, many women like us who've stood where they weren't welcomed, who've pushed back when they were shoved, who've claimed their agency even if it meant being demonized as corrupt influence on a whole generation of women. You meet some incredible artists, some globally famous through their work like actors um, Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin, singer Michelle Williams from the hugely popular band Mamas and the Papas, Judy Chicago, perhaps most famous for her work The Dinner Table. And you also get to learn about so many more. This film's script is held together by sheer audacity, designed to overwhelm. It's not just a simple series of interviews trying to recreate what it was like being a feminist in 70s America. It's a time capsule through the pages of a collection of photos published in the book Emergence in 1977. All the women we meet were bound in a sisterhood, featured in those black and white pictures, either already making a difference or working towards gender equality in some shape or form through art, performance and literature. It addresses how the term suffragette made way for the term feminist, which now is making way for intersectional feminism. It also addresses the criticism levied against the second wave of being too full of white women, only looking out for affluent ladies who had little to lose and plenty to fall back upon. Watch the movie Lakin. For those of us who didn't take up courses in college where feminist literature and art was taught to us, this is a rather accessible gateway towards understanding it better and the need to continue projects they began changing, evolving and including more as the movement progresses. And with that, it's time for number one! Time again for me to just casually remind you to click that box in the corner here and subscribe to my channel. Yaar. Number one. Unlimited Girls. You can watch it on cultureunplugged.com for free. The link is in the description. I'm kind of mad at myself for not having watched this essential Paromita Vora 2002 documentary before I started doing research for this video. And I'm talking about it immediately after feminists, what were they thinking because this came before that. Technological constraints of the time aside, it is a superior documentary gathering feminists, activists, artists in one film providing a crash course, if I may use the term again, into India's feminist movement. If you're one of those people who can't watch anything non-HD anymore, I would implore ki ignore the graininess, keep an eye on the visuals so you can see the names of the women who are talking and just kind of listen to this documentary like a dramatic podcast. Through Unlimited Girls, we explore India's women's movement through the eyes of a woman who just goes by the name Fearless. But we never actually see her. A huge portion of the film is shot in POV frames. Back when internet was just beginning to become accessible for regular use, Fearless participates in a feminist chat room where she's talking to women about finding love online and what it means to be a feminist. The documentary then beams you up and takes you back to 2002 when in India the word feminist was not mainstream. SMA, it's like having found a secret society with its own codes and rules and manifestos and it's a real thrill realizing now that somehow I find myself entirely aligned with this super group. The documentary is structured so wonderfully via a complicated screenplay germinating in the space between fiction and non-fiction right between the third and fourth waves of feminism masterfully edited by Jabin Merchant Paramita Vora's vision is so, so clear. She's exploring what it means to be an urban feminist in modern India, trying to grasp and acknowledge the contributions of women who've shaped India's women movements, including not just famous artists, authors and NGO workers, but also a housewife, a female cab driver. Uh, she's also exploring the role popular culture plays in shaping young narratives, movies, books, advertising. She does this by talking to young people about Bollywood songs, but her true genius shines through via hilarious and incredibly clever fake ads throughout the film. She's selling male gaze goggles. A feminist detector called the Miso Genie. And I'm sorry, I apologize for this comparison, but oh my god, freaking Wonder Vision literally just did that. Telling a story through sitcom tropes and make believe ads. 
I was blown away by how funny and prescient Unlimited Girls was. Using screens to tell a story way before computer screen films was a thing. Watch the movie to learn about famous Indian feminists like Sonal Shukla, Veena Mazumdar, Urvashi Bhutalia, among others. Learn more about the Calicut Women's Conference. Learn about the roots of the slogan, Ladke Lenge Azadi, which took on a feminist meaning years after it was first heard in Kashmir. Unlimited Girls is a prodigious free service available, and I will stress this again, for free on the internet, just like sitting there on cultureunplugged.com, waiting for you, 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 go. Link in description mein niche. And then show it to that friend who still says, Listen, I am all for women's rights and equality and stuff, but I don't call myself a feminist. And remind them that the term was first coined in the 1800s. It's time we understood what it means. And listen, that's it. Women's History Month me kuch acha karne ka mera man tha, aur khud ke jaane karna wada, kyunki ye baatein karne se abhi bhi pata nahi darte kyun hai log. Watch the documentaries I spoke about today, which is period end of sentence. What she said, the art of Pauline Kael, Daughters of Destiny, Feminists, What Were They Thinking, and Unlimited Girls. And then come tell me in the comments about your favorite uh, documentaries about women. Come on, I haven't seen it, so tell me. Check out my new merch shelf at the bottom, subscribe to the channel, because I really like doing this and I need to know that y'all are watching, so like, subscribe. <laughs>